welcome to today's presentation, Self-Care in a Selfless Field. The work of the Mountain Plains Prevention Technology Transfer Center is supported by HHS SAMHSA, and we would like you to note that today's presentation is provided free of charge and is available in the public domain. Also, the information presented today are the views and opinions of Jana Sill and Anna Perky and do not reflect the official position of HHS or SAMHSA. Please let us know if you have any questions about the information in this disclaimer. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenters today. Jana Sill and Anna Perky are graduate students in the School Psychology Education Specialist Program at the University of Utah. In addition to their graduate studies, Jana and Anna are also members of the University of Utah Technology and Training Education and Consultation Lab directed by Dr. Aaron Fisher. Their roles include collaborating with schools to implement positive behavior support and consultation with teachers to improve classroom management. I will now turn the time over to Jana and Anna. Thanks so much for having us here today. We're really happy to be presenting on this really important topic to you. Um, during these unprecedented times, we are all express, experiencing um, the stress of the current pandemic and all of the changes that it's brought to our daily lives. In recognition of this, we would like to take a moment, a mindful moment, if you will, um, to start our, present, our webinar and our presentation. So please just take a moment to take a couple deep breaths with us and prepare for the content. Okay, so um, now time, Jana, and participants at the end of this webinar, participants will be able to define and understand the value of self-care for prevention professionals, and they also will be able to define compassion fatigue and burnout, and how it differs from stress and how it can impact your ability to effectively engage and support your clients. So identify um, self-care strategies and resources to reduce the effects of compassion, fatigue, and burnout. Um, so that's our objectives for today. And um, I want to start our presentation followed by um, Anna's um, mindful moment with um, just an explanation about what's self-care. So self-care, the official, uh, one of the um, used definitions says that this defines the learned behavior of practice and activities initiated and performed by individuals to maintain health, life, and well being. So, in other words, self care is any activity that we do deliberately in order to take care of our mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, professional, and relational health. So, you can see that self care. It, Globes a lot of aspects of our lives. And good self care is key to improve our mood and to also reduce anxiety. So, although this is a very, um, well, it seems like a, 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 easy, a simple um, concept in theory, a lot of times is um, um, overlooked. So, I think the key, at least for me, in this um, definition is that. It needs to be something that you're doing with the intention of improving yourself. It can be anything, but you need to, to choose that with that intention to count as self-care. Um, so why is self-care important? So good self-care is key to improve, like I said, um, your mood and reduce anxiety, which can be a reason to cause a lot of problems in your life. It also improves overall health and well-being, which is um, often hurt in many places right now. So um, self-care, it's a potential factor in preventing the development of negative outcomes and helping 
others such as burnout and compassion fatigue, which we're going to be talking about today. So um, now that you know what is self-care and why it's important, I'm going to pass the time to Anna, who's going to talk about stress. Thanks so much, Jana. I wanted to apologize. We ran into a little technical difficulty with that video, um, but I think I figured out how to get that to work for the next section. Um, but without further ado, let's talk about work-related stress. These are areas on the slide that you see um, that were identified in the literature as being frequent areas of stress for individuals such as profession prevention specialists and helping professionals across all fields. So. You know, when you think about your role as someone who works with a lot of different kinds of people, um, we come to know our clients in a really in-depth way. And due to the type of trusting and reinforcing relationships that we have with our clients, we come to know a lot of the experiences they've had and we they feel comfortable talking to us about those things. And part of that is, you know, being exposed to the trauma that they have experienced in their lives and talking at great lengths about those things. So that was one of the areas that was identified as, as a common stressor and um, related to work. Additionally, insufficient time and resources. So perhaps not having enough time to spend with our clients and the resources that and that we need to support them and help them make the changes in their lives that they need to make not receiving enough payment for or compensation for the work that we do, um, large caseloads. So this might be just a sheer number of numerous clients that you have to work with, or it could be an, a lot of uh, several clients that have some particularly difficult situations that they're dealing with that are more stressful. Um, a loss of sense of safety. So, you know, part of that exposure to some of these stories that we're hearing about our clients' lives is that we, we might start to feel unsafe based on the things that they're telling us about, or you might be working with a client that you don't feel safe around or that has engaged in something that might have been a dangerous activity and that um, diminishes your sense of safety. Lack of control. Um, when we work with humans, that's just part of part of our work is that we can't control the way that people behave at all times, and and that can be uh, stressful. Unsupportive supervi supervisors or colleagues. So if you don't have a supervisor who's checking in with you fairly regularly or has scheduled time to meet with you to talk about your cases um, or colleagues that jump in to help at the last minute when maybe you really just need to spend some time doing something else, that can really contribute to that work-related stress. So let's talk about compassion fatigue. Um, Dr. Charles Figley has done a lot of research in this area, and so I'm going to be referring to him quite a bit throughout this discussion of compassion fatigue. Um, this quote is from one of the chapters that he wrote, and I think it's really helpful for understanding this. In our effort to view the world from the perspective of the suffering, we suffer. The meaning of compassion is to bear suffering. And I think this is a really important thing to consider when we're working with our clients who might be experiencing trauma in their lives and are talking to us about it. You know, and, and because we are people that are working in a helping field and we want to, we have a desire to help people, we can't avoid compassion and we can't avoid a feeling empathy towards others. Um, and Dr. Figley also said they that this compassion and empathy provide the tools that are required in the art of human service. And I think that's very accurate that we have to be able to understand our clients' experiences, that em empathy is really important. And I think it's also important to point out that compassion fatigue can impact people who aren't necessarily working directly with someone who has experienced trauma, people that um, might just be hearing or learning about trauma secondhand. For example, um, lawyers who might view um, really graphic images as part of a case that they're working on, insurance claims workers who are hearing about really traumatic situations of of the people they're working with and librarians cataloging disturbing artifacts are all examples of a way to experience secondary trauma. So that might be another term that you've heard before is secondary trauma. Um, and that's, they can kind of, these terms can be used somewhat interchangeably. 
So next, let's talk about the factors of compassion fatigue. So Dr. Fig Figley has identified um, several factors that contribute to the development of compassion fatigue, and we're going to talk about a couple of those right now. Um, empathic ability is one of the first areas, and this is purely that ability to feel and understand what someone else is feeling and to experience those feelings with them. Um, so if, if the, and the, Dr. Figley um, also mentioned that empathic ability can become a burden if the intake of the disturbing information is not managed. So just hearing that information can, can be very burdensome. Empathic concern. Um, he explains that this empathic concern is what motivates us to want to help and to provide services to others. Um, and we have to have this empathic concern in order to take us to that next step of not only listening to these situations, but doing something to help someone. Empathic response refers to the work that we do and the actual response that we make when we try to help someone who is suffering or experiencing trauma. So through this, we try to understand how they're feeling and gain a sense of those those feelings and, and kind of we thought we take some of those experiences into ourselves to to really emphasize and understand them additionally these uh, other factors can compound the effects of compassion fatigue so traumatic memories now these can be memories just that the therapist has or the prevention specialist or another helping professional this might be even just from working with people that have experienced trauma or your own trauma that you've experienced in your lifetime. Simply hearing about someone else's trauma can trigger these memories of, that we've had of really traumatic situations, whether they were our own or someone we've worked with. Um, other life demands. So someone who is on the road towards um, and get, having compassion fatigue, some of those life demands that that might be stressful and difficult to deal with normally become insurmountable. And things like financial hardships or a health concern that um, arrives, different types of things like that that kind of just show up in our lives, which we would normally feel overwhelmed by and a little bit stressed becomes really insurmountable and we, we can't quite get past them once we've started down the road towards compassion fatigue. Let's look at some of the signs of compassion fatigue um, and things that you, you can be looking for if you're starting to experience this. Um, and I think it's important to point out, we're gonna talk about burnout in just a bit. Jana is gonna talk in depth about that. Um, compassion fatigue though, unlike burnout, can develop really quickly um, rather than developing over time. So you, it may emerge without expectation. Um, so it's, it's important to be aware of some of these um, signs that indicate that it's developing. Some of the signs are intrusive thoughts. So you're having a hard time focusing on your work because these images or these memories or these thoughts of, of a patient or client's trauma is coming into your mind. Difficulty sleeping, having a hard time getting to sleep at night and staying asleep and, and really thinking about these things. Irritability, so getting overwhelmed and, and irritable and possibly angry more than you normally would. Headaches. Um, somatic complaints can start to occur as well. Uh, anger, hyper arousal, or also hyper vigilance. So being constantly on guard and aware of what's going on around you. Uh, avoidance, this might be avoidance of client and you may not wanna talk about certain type of topics, certain topics with them because you wanna avoid those traumatic experiences that they've, that they've had. Um, or you might avoid different um, individuals as much as you're able to and also start to kind of feel a sense of dread when working with certain individuals. Reduced empathy, so this is a really important one, is not feeling that same empathy and that same empathic response when someone is experiencing um, a traumatic event or when they're talking to you about something that they've experienced. This leads to impaired decision-making as well, so we may not make decisions that are in our client's best interest if we um, are experiencing compassion, compassion fatigue. And we may not implement our, our treatments in the same way. Also, we might experience um, isolation from others and kind of feeling like you're, you're isolated from your support group um, and, and like you're not able to connect with them in the same way. And some of the areas that he indicates are, are especially important to pay attention to is the uh, um, the feelings of isolation, but also a sense of helplessness and that you're not able to change what's happening.
So now, um, what are some of the effects of compassion fatigue? It reduces our capacity or our interest in bearing the suffering of others. So, you know, that, that piece, that empathy, it reduces our ability to feel empathic towards the people that we work with. Um, so it has negative impacts We've talked a little bit about this already, but on decision making, so we may not make the best decisions for our clients. Um, we may not start, we may not continue to seek professional development. We may not seek to improve ourselves when we're experiencing compassion fatigue. Also, this can have an impact on career longevity. If we're feeling fatigued with our, with our work and that we can't feel empathy and gain the same kind of satisfaction that we used to from our work, we may quit and find another, another um, path and another career. So this, and you know, really we, we wanna keep our helping professionals healthy and, and interested in their jobs because we're doing really important work. Now I'm gonna turn the time over to Jana to talk to you about burnout. Thank you, Anna. So here's just a little bit of humor to help decrease your stress a little bit. And although even if possible, um, the best option in regards of stress is to learn how to manage for sure. We don't want to outsource that. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so now you're going to see um, my favorite my favorite definition of burnout. So here, uh, burnout, burnout is described as a state of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion caused by long-term involvement in emotionally demanding situations. Then the next one says, a state of fatigue or frustration brought about by devotion to a cause, way of life, or relationship that failed to produce the expected reward. So I believe both definitions embrace the essence of burnout, with the first stressing the part that exhaustion plays in it, and the second focusing on the sense of disappointment that is as, it, as its core. Um, like self-care, burnout um, can be in different settings of our lives and can look different, right? Um, so and although we are going to focus on the professional setting um, during this webinar, you can easily apply uh, the principles you learn here to uh, you learn here today to other parts of your life. And as a graduate student and mother of five amazing um, girls, I'm often exhausted. So many, if not all of us, uh, feel exhaustion at some point during the day and the week. So exhaustion is not. Um, it's not that physical exhaustion that we sometimes are used to feel. Um, that one, is, it's fine. The main problem uh, the, in regards of the exhaustion connected to burnout is that um, the burnout, the feelings of exhaustion, the different type of exhaustion that you feel when you burn out, it doesn't go away when you rest. And sadly, it mainly strikes people who are, who are highly committed to their work or school or relationship and so on. So like I mentioned before, a core part of burnout is a deep sense of disappointment, which can lead to much suffer. So it's definitely something that we wanna learn about and prevent. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so before diving more into burnout, I would like to point out some differences between burnout and stress, um, mainly because stress is something that we are all very familiar with and sometimes we just think that burnout, it's just a, a overload stress or like a, just a stress in a higher level. And it's not, it, it is different. And it's important to distinguish uh, the two and, and I'm gonna present some, some differences right now. So burnout often takes place over a long period of time, like Anna mentioned, and stress is of often relatively short term. Of course, some people, they live in a, stress, a stressful life, and, and that's also a different thing and can have different um, uh, factors. But in general, uh, stress is, is short term. So burnout often happens when you believe your work is meaningless, when um, there's a disconnect between what you're currently doing and what you truly want to be doing, or when things change for the worse. So for example, when you lose a supportive boss or when you, your workload increase um, beyond your, um, your ways of supporting. 
So symptoms of burnout stay with you during your vacation, weekend, so it doesn't go away. Even when you rest or that big project ends, you still feel the same symptoms. So that's kind of the difference. So stress, on the other hand, is often caused by feeling that work is out of control. Uh, but as soon as you are out of work, so as soon as you get home, you feel better. Or when weekends arrive or it's your vacation or a holiday, you feel better. Um, or as soon as you're done with that big project, um, then you can kind of feel like in peace again, right? Um, so that's when you're feeling stressed due to a project, which stress we all know that can uh, also bring us some uh, benefits when in moderate um, levels, of course. So you might express um, stress for several days in a row, especially, like I said, if you're engaged in a, in a big or a project or in a tight deadline. Um, however, as soon as that's done, you feel better, like right away. And with burnout, that does not happen. The, the project ends and you still feel the same way. Um, like I said, the weekend comes and you still feel the same way. So uh, both uh, stress and burnout can be associated with physical symptoms. Um, so including insomnia, muscle tension, headaches, and um, stomach problems. So just so you know. Um, it's also very important to note that stress and burnout can cause severe health problems, and you should seek a health professional if you have any concerns uh, over stress-related illness or if stress uh, is or burnout is causing significant or persistent unhappiness. So be wise on that. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, please. Okay, so now that we know that burnout is different than the, our traditional stress, uh, we are now going to uh, break down and the break down the term burnout into a little bit more, um, I guess, sections. So burnout has three main categories called emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and decreased sense of personal accomplish accomplishment. So that's kind of how they break down. Um, so let's now take a look at each one of them. So go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. So emotional exhaustion. Um, it's a state of feeling emotionally worn out and, and drained. So sometimes when you imagine a person that's stressed, they are usually hyper and they are everywhere. They are trying to get so many things done at the same time. A person that's uh, in a state of burnout and feeling emotional exhaustion, they are usually like just drained. Like they have so much to do, but just they cannot get anything done. And it's not because they're not trying, they're trying really hard, they just cannot get it done. Um, so that's kind of, kind of the difference. Um, so emotional exhaustion may cause lack of motivation, trouble with sleeping, irritability, physical fatigue, feelings of hopelessness, headaches, and change in appetite. So that's um, just a few of main classic symptoms. You can go ahead and move to the next slide. Okay, depersonalization. So it's a set of negative, inappropriate, and insensitive behaviors towards clients and work. So it's when you feel like you changed and the world has become vague. So it's dreamlike. So it's, it's like less real. So you are at work or you're with the client, but you kind of have a hard time engaging or, or even feeling present. I don't know if you've ever had a case where you're with a client and then the session's over or you work with that client's over and you're not even quite sure what happened uh, or what was done. So that's kind of like that depersonalization, like the, the, the vague dream-like types of feeling. So sometimes it's important to point out that it is common to feel that way sometimes. The only problems when such feelings become so excessive that interferes with our daily living. And that applies to any, anything that we're gonna talk about here today. Um, so go ahead to the next one. So reduce personal accomplishment. So negative evaluations about the self, a sense of ineffectiveness and incompetence. I like this little cartoon, it says employee of the uh, nanosecond. 
So it was nice while it lasted. So sometimes um, we just feel that we just, we're just not good enough, right? So it's that tendency to negatively um, evaluate our values at work. And we feel like we are insufficient regarding the ability to perform at work. And we just kind of have that general professional low self-esteem type of thing. So, and, and that can cause, like we, we can kind of um, see like just unhappiness. Like you just feel like, why bother? Like I, I just, I'm just not good enough. Might as well it's just quit. And, and sometimes, a lot of times, we just don't associate that all of this has been caused because we are by now and we need to address the reasons why we are feeling that way. And sometimes, yeah, we can change um, to a different uh, place, workplace, or we can um, switch a few things, but it's important to kind of analyze and, and see what's causing um, those feelings and kind of look to the root of the problem for sure. Okay, so we talk a lot about burnout. So now I'm gonna pass the time to Anna and she will talk about self-assessment. Thanks, Jana. So we wanted to talk to you a little bit about how you can do an assessment of these different areas that we've talked about today for yourself and kind of get an understanding of where you're falling, what your levels are of in these different areas of compassion, fatigue, and burnout. Um, the professional quality of life, compassion, satisfaction, and fatigue um, scale provides information for you about your levels and how you kind of fall in these different areas. It also includes compassion satisfaction, which we didn't spend a lot of time talking about today, but this is that sense of confidence that you get from your job and your sense of fulfillment that you're making a difference, you know, and, and satisfaction that, that what you're doing is, is satisfying and it, and it helps you feel um, good about your work. And, you know, at, at any given time, we might have different levels of these things. But I think this is a really helpful thing to do just to get understanding of where we might fall. Um, if you wanted to do something more informal, you could make a list of all of the different areas in your life that might be causing you stress. These don't have to just be work related things. There might be things in your personal life, you know, a relationship that might be stressful right now. Um, the general the things we're going through right now are stressful. Um, we've had to make a lot of changes to our daily lives in, order, in response to the pandemic. So it's just kind of thinking about those different things and you can identify what is the thing that you can make, what is the smallest thing you can do to make the biggest difference for yourself. So pick one of those items and find a way to implement some self-care to make a change in that area. Um, and we provided a link. So we have a resource flyer that we're going to be sharing with you. And there's a link to this, uh, to the ProQOL, the Professional Quality of Life um, questionnaire, so that you can complete it and gain an understanding of where you might fall in these different areas. So now we want to shift the discussion away from burnout and compassion, fatigue, and look at the different things that we can do to care for ourselves. So the self-care strategies that you can implement starting today to make changes in how you're managing some of the stress that might be occurring in your life as a result of the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the changes you've had to make to your work and just general life stressors that might be occurring for you. And I think you know, it's really important to consider this quote, taking care of myself doesn't mean me first, it means me too. And I think engaging in self-care is not meant to be something that is selfish. It's something that we should do in order to continue to care for and feel empathy towards our clients. So it's a really important thing for each of us to be doing. So we wanted to take some time to talk about working from home and how you can help yourself maintain um, you know, this good home life balance while we're, we may be social distancing or your work may not be able to be completed in the office like it usually was. Um, so these are some different recommendations that were provided by the National Alliance of Mental Illness in a resource and information guide that they, um, that they shared on their website. We've also included a link to this guide on our resource flyer as well so you can review it. Um, but you know, so many of us have had to shift our lives from working in an office to working at home and that's a hard transition to make. But what, so one thing we can do is 
find these different ways to, to separate our home and our work. So one way is to designate, designate a specific space in your home where you're going to be doing your work. So given we may not have like a separate room that we could go to, but we may be able to find a corner of a room where we can have our, our work supplies are right there. And as soon as the work day is over, we stop, put those things away. If that means putting them in a basket, to kind of like mentally put that thing away and, and physically do it at the same time. That's one thing you can do as well is put those things out of sight once the work day is finished. Continue to maintain a regular routine on days you would normally go into work. So having a routine and structure is really also, it's very helpful to reduce some of those anxious feelings we might be having just as a result of all of the changes going on and, um, that we've had to make at home and at work. So if you can continue to maintain that same uh, routine that you had each morning before you went to work, set an alarm, maybe pack a lunch, have something ready for you to eat that's healthy and that you um, can pull out of the fridge and start eating at the time at your lunch time. Um, get ready for the day. Maybe you don't have to go as it, you know, as get as nicely dressed as you normally would for your work day, but still make that transition from, you know, being in our pajamas to our work clothes. And and that's can be really helpful just to have these routines in place um, so that we can see, feel like we're not still still working. They also suggest refraining from doing your work like in your bed or in a place that you would normally be trying to relax. So that finding that specific space where you can do your work is really helpful. Um, make sure that you're also scheduling breaks in. Now these can be breaks to go for a walk or, you know, have a snack, but just making sure you're putting this time into your schedule, including breaks for self-care. So build that into your day, even if it's just watching a really short mindfulness video to practice some deep breathing, um, whatever works for you, but just making sure that you're building in those breaks throughout the day. Um, set goals to guide your work. So what make a to-do list either the night before or the day that you're getting started. What do you need to accomplish that day? And as you actively finish those things, check them off the list. It really helps to feel like you're accomplishing things and, and you can have that physical uh, evidence that you've done something and that's really fulfilling. Um, continue to communicate with your colleagues. So even though we may not be at work like we usually are, we need to be able to maintain that communication with the people that we work with. And that can mean just, you know, having a, a video chat each morning to check in and see how everyone's doing um, and set some goals for the day together, but also, you know, sending emails and just being in touch with each other and checking in. Um, and it's also important to maybe consider um, you know, finding a way to build in like virtual coffee breaks. So maybe you can't go get coffee together at work, um, but you can have a video chat and drink your coffee together and, and have a chat about things not related to work. Gianna's gonna talk to you a little bit about other self-care strategies that you can do right now. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Um, so, my next slide is about sleep. For sure, um, hands down, that's my favorite um, self-care strategy. Um, it's just it's not, not easy to do, but it's just, it's just so good. But essentially, um, establishing good sleep habit and hygiene by waking up and going to bed at the same time, or at least um, around the same time each day, uh, even on weekends, are, are very crucial. That way, your body, our minds, um, like our life get into a rhythm that we feel like okay yeah i got this we're we're in control if you like that we're in control so also another important thing to keep in mind is that before you go to bed make sure you list um, your goals um, just kind of create your to-do list for the um, coming day so that way you don't have to worry about it or so you're not thinking uh while you're trying to sleep you're not thinking about okay i need to make sure i do this, this, and that. You're not thinking about that anymore you, because it's already in the paper. So um, this is definitely a good habit to create that can lower uh, feelings of anxiety and can also give you a sense of control and um, reduces that cognitive load um, that sometimes uh, kind of blocks us from falling asleep. So we are currently living in a very strange um, and stressful time. Uh, many people are uh, suffering a lot with the, with the virus and as fear mounts about medical financial implications of the pandemic, 
um, you may be tossing and turning it all night, uh, worrying about um, how all those things are affecting your life and how sometimes we feel out of control. And that can definitely um, affect our sleep quality. So it's, it's very important to create a routine, uh, like just a bed, bedtime routine, just like we tell our kids to have, you know, our nephews or whoever, little kids. Um, we, it's important for us as well. So uh, bedtime routine, as well as relaxation, um, anything that you know that can help prom promote a, a better rest for you, it's important to definitely um, do it every day. So now Anne is going to talk a little bit more about eating healthy. So it's easy when we're home, I think, to sometimes go to the fridge and get maybe our, our or the snack cupboard and get things out that may not be as healthy. Um, but we definitely have the opportunity at home to maybe make some healthier choices as far as, you know, eating things that are more nutrient dense, such as like fruits and vegetables, um, nuts and seeds can be really helpful, um, and, and whole grains, finding those opportunities to eat those healthier snacks is really helpful as well to kind of give yourself that steady supply of fuel so you can keep functioning at your at your best level and maintain that energy throughout your workday. So, you know, to kind of avoid that, that desire to, you know, uh, eat some of those less healthy things, certainly having those things, you know, we shouldn't have to make drastic changes to our diets and having those things is still great. But I think focusing when we're working at home on how we can maintain that healthy diet is really important. Um, so, you know, one thing we can do is just cut up fruits and veggies and eat them on a plate, you know, when we take one of our self-care breaks um, and eat those instead of, you know, like we have the, the benefit of not being able to go to, you know, the, the vending machine right now because we're, we're working from home, many of us. So, um, you know, you can find ways to, to make those healthier decisions and, um, when, you know, bringing healthy foods from home whenever possible when we're going back to work. Um, and or even just, you know, picking a meal that day where you're like, I'm going to eat healthy the, for, for lunch or for dinner. I'm going to take that time to put some extra fruits and vegetables on my plate. Um, and just making it something that you, you schedule into your day is really helpful to keep that energy level up. Yeah, and then... Um... Also, it's very important to um, get active or stay active. So it's important for us to um, take some time during the day, whatever works for you, um, to do any type of exercise. Like everything that we talked about today, um, it looks different for all of us. Like some things work out for me that doesn't work out for Anna or, you know, so we are all different. So it's important for you to think uh, what works for you. Uh, what does being active uh, means to you? What, what's fun about it? Or even if it doesn't sound as fun um, to some people, just try to find something that you enjoy um, that, that can help you stay active. So uh, there are tons of videos online that you can find um, guided instruction um, to uh, work out at home now that all the gyms are currently closed. Or you can also simply go for a walk. And, um, and it's important to also remember that exercise can also help you uh, help improve your, your sleep quality. Um, and, and again, like it, it's extremely important. So make sure you take the time to at least walk um, anytime possible. Go to the next slide, Anna. Another area that Dr. Figley talks about is really maintaining that support system to help avoid um, developing compassion fatigue. So, and, and also if you're having these feelings of compassion fatigue, talk to someone about it. Talk to a coworker, see how they're doing. Um, taking that time to check in with our colleagues is really important and checking in with family and friends, you know, and, and really the more, the number of people and the variety that we have for our support system makes a huge Huge difference and provides us with that ability to, you know, find someone to connect with, you know, when it's time to de-stress or, you know, take that walk and just really identifying individuals that can, can serve in your support system is really helpful. 
and it's, it's um, you know, we can also set our self care goals with our family members or with our friends or our colleagues. Um, and that's a great way to kind of build some of that um, accountability when it comes to following up with these self care goals that we might set. And right now, a great way to connect with each other and to maintain these support systems is to utilize phone calls and video chats. Um, we're all getting much more comfortable with video conferencing um, in this time because it's just something that we're utilizing to maintain that, that, um, that contact with others that we're working with or with people that we care about. Um, so, you know, organize virtual get togethers with family and friends. Um, schedule regular time that you're checking in with each other. And, you know, with colleagues, just make sure that you're checking in just to see how each other are doing and, and offer support um, and let each other know that you're, you're going through the same thing right now and, and things are really difficult. So it, it helps to have that, um, that opportunity to, to kind of normalize with, with each other and, and let each other know that we're, we're experiencing similar things. Yeah, so um, I agree with you, Anna. And I think it's also um, important for us to keep in mind just simple things that we can do that can kind of brings us down a little bit, that can calm us down a little bit. And one, another example is just take a deep breath. Um, chronic stress um, can cause a chain of negative factors um, in, in your life and can cause, um, can lead definitely um, poor habits. So if you're not too much into meditation uh, or if you just, you just don't feel like right now or you just don't have the time to learn or the desire to learn, at least practice taking deep breaths. Every time when you feel like you're anxious or that you're just too tired or you, or anytime just that just that simple uh habit can help your body know that it's okay everything's going to be okay so just um, keep that in mind and uh and for sure you see and you feel uh, much better so um, deep breathing has been researched and, and seen that it can lower, can help lower uh, high blood pressure. It can ease the, um, the muscle tension uh, in your body and also help release stress. So uh, practice meditation if all possible, because it is wonderful. If not, at least um, take, get in the habit of just taking deep breaths anytime possible. You can go ahead, Anna. Engaging in mindfulness is um, something that you can do that uh, is a great way to engage in self-care anywhere you at, you're at. So you can do these activities you know, at home, when you're out for a walk, and it's just a great way to, to de-stress. Um, so I have a quote here from uh, John Kabat-Zinn. He's a, uh, like, he founded mindfulness in the Western um, area. So I just wanted to, um, to talk up, to share this quote with you. Um, the awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment by moment. And he it really captures that experience of taking that time out from our busy day to maybe just check in with what's going on around us and taking those deep breaths like Jana mentioned, but also just what can you hear right now? What are the smells that you're experiencing right now? And just really checking in with your body and how you're, what you're, um, what your stress level might be and how can you, how do you recognize that you're starting to feel stressed? Are your hands clenched? Um, are you start, is your jaw clenched? You know, are you starting to maybe um, to feel like you're starting to have, your heart is starting to race? What are those different things that tip you off to let you know that you're starting to feel stressed so that you can check in and, and maybe reduce some of those feelings? So just for the sake of time, because we wanna make sure you guys have time to ask some of the questions that you have, um, I'm gonna go ahead and skip over our, our example of a body scan. Um, it's provided by Headspace and I, I really, we included a link to their YouTube channel on our resource flyer because they offer some really 
great um, free, like super quick um, meditations, but also just some different ideas about how to de-stress and check in with yourself and be mindful. Um, and since it's on their YouTube channel, they're entirely free to watch. So um, body scan is just one of the examples that we had, but I think it's great to check those out um, and you have access to those on our resource flyer. Next, we wanted to talk about scheduling your self-care. Um, this schedule was actually in, a, in an article that I read that was written by um, individuals who work with oncology patients and who manage nurses who work with oncology patients. So their goal was to develop a schedule and each individual contributed an idea to the schedule and it allowed the, the staff to check in with each other and say, hey, did you do your self-care last night? We were supposed to journal. How did it go? It helps us hold accountable each other and ourselves for engaging in these really essential activities in maintaining um, our abilities to continue being the empathic, um, caring people that we are. And it's just a, it's a great way to you know, to set aside that time and say, oh, you know, I really got to make sure that I um, take that time to do some yoga today, and then I'm going to check in with my colleagues about it tomorrow. Um, but I think it, it's just a great way to ensure that you're following up with those different activities. And now I'm going to turn the time over to Gianna. She's going to describe some of the different resources that we've also included on our resource flyer. So don't feel like you have to memorize these things. You're going to see them again. Um, but we just wanted to talk to you about them a little bit before um, ending our presentation today. Yeah, thank you, Anna. So I'm going to uh, briefly uh, talk about each one of them. Like Anna mentioned, you have access to all this information. So um, I'm just going to quickly review. Um, so we talked about several things today. And here are just uh, some resources that can help improve your self-care. So there are tons of apps um, and great um, free um, um, apps that can help you increase and learn more about mindfulness and meditation. And here's a list of the um, apps that, that are currently on our resources flyer as well. Um, go ahead to the next slide. And here uh, we, put it to, we put together a, just a short list of books um, that can help you learn more about self-care. And that definitely can, um, can, can just uh, increase your knowledge, which can increase your desire to practice self-care. So uh, the benefit about books now is that you can just listen to it. You don't have to be sitting down reading. So you can just listen in your way to work or in your way home. So it's definitely a great option. Um, uh, there are also blogs. Um, on the next slide, slide. So here are just examples of blogs and those blogs, they are um, like free of charge, like I think all blogs, right? And they are all about um, self-care and how we can create habits that can promote uh, a better um, life and how can uh, it can help us a uh, few better. So you can definitely take a look on that. Go ahead to the next slide. Okay, so to end our, um, our presentation, we, we were trying to uh, make sure if you could just think of one thing or if you could just kind of remember one point of our talk, um, which is very hard to just choose one thing. Uh, but our message is that I always remember that self-care is personal, it's unique to you, and it looks different to all of us. So if sometimes you're in Facebook and you see someone uh, doing something that, you know, that, oh my gosh, that looks so much fun. Why I cannot have a life like that? Or, or something that somebody tells you to do because it's good for them, but it's not good for you. Um, and you feel like maybe this just doesn't work for me. I always remember that self-care is different and you need to put the time to uh, look and search and read about the things that can help you feel better, that can help you improve your life, improve your work, improve your personal life. So self-care can make our life uh, be more meaningful and it can help us um, just improve our whole well-being. So make sure to take time to explore and find what works best for you. And we hope that you can choose one strategy or resource that we share with you today um, to apply to your daily life and our weekly routine 
So uh, check out our uh, resources um, flyer that you're all going to have access to it. And let us know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Jana and Anna. That was fantastic.